Hello, everyone. I'm Rania Kalik for Breakthrough News, and this is Dispatches. Today, I'm joined by Joseph Massad, Professor of Modern Arab Politics and Intellectual History at Columbia University, to discuss recent developments in the Middle East following Israel's latest war on Gaza. Joseph, welcome so much. Uh, we're so happy to have you on. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. I'm delighted. So let's just get right into it. I wanted to start by asking you, you know, as we've seen this issue of Palestine getting so much more attention in the mainstream, which is excellent, um, I think it's important to discuss why it's so crucial to incorporate anti-imperialism into the analysis of Palestine. Because there does seem to be this new stream of liberalism that's vocal on this issue, but is silent or even in some cases pro-imperialist on the rest of the region. Some examples include, you know, people who are pro-Palestine, but maybe they're pro U.S. regime change war on Syria or on Libya. So um, how do you see this as like a new phenomenon and how do we deal with it? Um, I think that's an important question. Um, this is not a new phenomenon in the Arab world. In fact, this strand of liberal Arab opinion that is pro-imperialist began in relation to Israel as a result of the conclusion of the Camp David Accords between Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin back in 1978. It is at that point that a new crop, if you will, of Egyptian liberal intellectuals were produced, singing the praises of pro-imperialism, um, and of becoming basically agents of U.S. empire as well as cronies of the Israelis. And that that would, um, I mean, their, their argument was that this would indeed be of benefit to the Egyptian people economically and politically. Of course, it brought utter economic devastation to uh, Egypt. Egypt was one of the first countries that was forced to go neoliberal by uh, you know, programs of U.S. aid and the IMF and the World Bank as a result of its deal with Israel. So that's when it begins. Um, uh, and at that point was this kind of a pro-imperialist line and pro-settler colonial line was seen as somehow a, a pragmatic or a pragmatist approach as opposed to old style uh, revolutionary leftist vocabulary that seemed a demo day in more recent years. We begin to see sort of also a new crop of Palestinian intellectuals in the late 1980s who wanted to capitalize on the success of the first Palestinian uprising in 1987 through uh, 1993. Um, uh, some of these intellectuals based on the West Bank or associated with the PLO outside, um, in capitalizing on the uprising, began to argue for a so-called negotiated settlement with Israel and the US, that it was important for the Palestinians to have good relations with the US, to give up on the armed struggle, and to accept what is pragmatically possible to be granted by the Israelis and by US power. Uh, around the same time, or a couple of years later, after 1990 and Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, you have also another crop of Iraqi diaspora or exile-based intellectuals who began to also argue for, uh, you know, pro-imperialist positions, in fact, calling upon the U.S. to invade Iraq, and at that time, uh, uh, sort of cheering it on. And some of them were in like, for example, Kanaan Makia was disappointed in 1991 that they did not bomb uh, uh, Iraq sufficiently or Baghdad. He would certainly come back. Uh, and this would continue through the 2003 uh, major invasion of Iraq, uh, which they also cheered. Um, so we see a progression of the sort. Then um, around to the year 2000, simultaneously with some of these events, uh, after the death of Hafez al-Assad, which many of his, of course, liberal opponents were eagerly awaiting, we begin to see also a new pro-U.S. kind of position about U.S. economic penetration, if not imperial intervention in Syria. Um, by 2000, uh, and of course, it was associated with the cultural attaché at the U.S. embassy at that time, creating all kinds of cultural salons, where basically using um, legitimate complaints about the regime to push for imperial intervention, um, both and, and economic penetration. Uh, in 2005, we see something similar coming up in Lebanon after the assassination of Prime Minister Hariri, during which also many of the so-called Lebanese revolutionaries were demanding imperial intervention to save Lebanon, uh, allegedly from Syria, but certainly not from Israel. 
and therefore the concentration remained on a kind of a positive uh, evaluation of the U.S. role in the region, even though Lebanon had been one of the major victims of that role since the, the late 1950s. Um, and then this takes us to 2011 onwards, where you have sort of uh, uh, both uh, uh, secular liberals and Islamist liberals that, uh, especially in the cases of Syria and Libya, openly like their the predecessors in, you know, uh, amongst the Iraqi diaspora intellectuals were calling upon the US or NATO to invade their own countries and to bring forth democracy, which they claimed was lacking. So this is sort of the historical trajectory of this thought. As you can see, it kind of accelerated and intensified hugely after the fall of the Soviet Union in the late, uh, and the weakening of the Soviet Union in the late 1980s and early 1990s. And then it sort of flowered and blossomed uh, across the Arab world, uh, wherein it became quite respectable to call upon um, the US to invade uh, uh, one's own country, to liberate one from it. Mind you, it's quite odd, for example, the Palestinians have been colonized since 1948, uh, at least in 1948, Israel, and in the West Bank since 1967. At most, in the last you know couple of decades, we had heard some appeals to the United Nations to intervene and perhaps uh, uh, station some troops to protect the Palestinians from Israeli colonial aggression. But we've ne we had never heard the Palestinians call upon the U.S. to invade, for example, Israel or Palestine and liberate them. So it's kind of interesting how some of the oppressed seem to espouse this kind of an intervention, imperial interventionist position, while others uh, still appeal to a kind of old style um, neutrality of the United Nations as a force uh, that could be deployed in defense of civilians uh, from uh, military invasions. Yeah, that's a really good point. And then now that, um, you know, I, I noticed this, this way that Palestine's being discussed now that it's kind of being allowed this debate in the mainstream to some degree, right? The parameters of the debate have uh, expanded a little bit, but it's only based on Israel-Palestine and the rest of the region is always disconnected and remains disconnected in the way it's discussed. And this is where I think it's so important to incorporate, incorporate that sort of anti-imperialist discourse. And we can get into that a little bit more uh, as we continue this conversation, but I wanted to turn for a moment to the issue of the Arab Spring, um, because you actually have said you've written about the fact that you see secular and Islamist liberals, which you mentioned before, you hold them responsible for actually destroying the Arab uprisings. So can you talk about what you mean by that? Yes, indeed. Um, I mean, I um, one of the most fascinating things that happened in 2011 in a number of countries uh, within the Arab world was a kind of a multi-class, uh, I would say, uh, collectivities who participated in demonstrations, who, demonstra who uh, participated in sit-ins. Many sectors of the working class staged uh, strikes, um, and these were ongoing, especially in places like Tunisia and Libya, uh, sorry, Tunisia and Egypt, rather. And um, in both places, we've seen these uh, uh, multi-class alliances or multi-class collectivities um, of, of revolutionary action or of oppositional action being taken over by perhaps the two most organized uh, groups as a result of funding or perhaps a history of organization. Perhaps the best uh, uh, financed group were the secular liberals, who are of course US and EU and British financed, uh, both by governments and by the NGOs, and who tout a kind of a liberal Western line of uh, human rights and civil and political rights. They mostly shy away from mentioning economic rights or economic democracy, although on occasion they may pay some lip service to issues of social justice. Um, uh, some of the more radical amongst them would fight for something like minimum wage as a kind of a radical dem demand. <clears throat> Similarly, we also see uh, the Islamist liberals who are perhaps um, not as well financed, but definitely better organized historically. 
um, and who've had a much longer history of oppositional uh, movements uh, within the region. But the liberal amongst them also, you know, uh, uh, come from the middle class, uh, but they do have multi-class alliances, but they also have business class friends and are like the secular liberals who also have business class sponsors, are much more attuned to neoliberal economics. So as a result, both groups, because of their better organization and certainly better finances, uh, and who spoke a liberal Western language of uh, economic uh, neoliberalism and political liberalism with some aspect of social justice, depending on who was speaking, um, uh, they took charge of a lot of these uh, demonstrations and marches and sit-ins and began to speak for them. And um, one of the interesting things that happened early on is that not only did they demand only these kinds of liberal uh, uh, remedies such as elections, as if the problem, for example, in a place like Egypt, which suffers from utter poverty, was that the people could not elect someone like uh, Mubarak, but rather, uh, uh, so ha had they elected him and remained poor, they would have been happy, for example. And now, of course, political repression and the lack of political democracy was endemic to uh, uh, the country or also to places like uh, Tunisia or uh, Libya or elsewhere, not to mention, of course, Jordan and Oman and Saudi Arabia and Morocco uh, and many of these other countries where uprisings uh, did take place. Uh, However, it seemed that the economic was always um, a, of secondary importance at best. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as a result, uh, what we see, uh, both groups appealed, first of all, to the imperial sponsors of the very autocrats they wanted to overthrow. They wanted to reassure imperialism that they support neoliberalism, that they would not threaten the economic interests of the West. And at the same time, uh, that they adhered at most to liberal aspects of uh, what uh, uh, you know, U.S. and Western-sponsored human rights groups consider human rights, which of course do not include medical care for all, does not include free education for all, does not include housing rights, etc. These are considered social and economic rights, but not political uh, or human rights, rather. So, uh, as a result, as this is. Uh, took place, we begin to see uh, these two groups as rivals attempting to uh, win these electoral uh, races. Um, and um, to be frank, of course, the uh, Islamist liberals were much more committed to Western-style political democracy, both in rhetoric and in practice, as opposed to the secular liberals, whom I would uh, 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 claim that in the last uh, uh, five decades in the Arab world, uh, these secular liberals have been the main enemies of even liberal types of political democracy, um, mostly because um, uh, they sort of support electoral democracy uh, as long as they win, and they are always ready to turn against it if Islamists win. I always use the analogy uh, in the US about uh, a conservative being a liberal who got mugged. I always say uh, in the Arab world, a fascist is a liberal who lost elections to, uh, a secular liberal who lost elections to an Islamist liberal. So, that's, so in that sense, um, we see this, of course, repeated a, a number of times. We saw this in 1992 in Algeria when the Islamists won or the elections. Uh, uh, the liberals supported a military coup d'etat, which ultimately uh, led to a civil war that killed over 200,000 Algerians. We saw this in uh, 2007 in uh, uh, in Gaza and the West Bank, where. Uh, the liberals supported a coup d'etat against the Hamas, which had won the elections, um, a coup d'etat that was quite successful in the West Bank, but failed uh, in uh, Gaza. Uh, and then we saw this yet again in 2013 in Egypt, when uh, liberals uh, supported the uh, Mubarakist forces and, and the old uh, guard and uh, retaking uh, control of the country once they lost elections. So we have seen uh, uh, this repeat itself several times uh, by the very, very same forces. Uh, so mind you, uh, like I said, I think both uh, uh, kinds of liberals, secular and Islamist, um, have equally sort of in a way hijacked the agenda of the, of the expressed needs and desires of, of, of those uh, who revolted against uh, tyranny. Um, however, uh, in all honesty, the, 
the Islamist liberals in places like Egypt and Tunisia were much more committed to uh, uh, liberal types of democratic rule than uh, their secular liberal uh, antagonists. Now, we see something, of course, different that uh, transpired in Syria and Libya, as I mentioned earlier, where both secular and Islamist uh, liberals and conservatives, of course, uh, all supported uh, uh, outright invasions of their countries um, to overthrow uh, uh, their rulers. Um, and ultimately brought about the utter destruction, uh, uh, both physical destruction, economic destruction, and human destruction um, of so many lives in Libya and, of course, a lot more uh, in Syria. Uh, uh, Yemen, of course, was also fell victim to a similar uh, dynamic, uh, ultimately. So, um, in large measure, I see that sort of much of the destruction that has been brought about since 2011, even though it was not brought about directly by liberals in power, it was brought about by their support if they were in the opposition or by their support if they did serve in government, uh, let alone in NGOs and others who tried to cover up the extent of the repression that followed, say, you know, a coup d'etat or, you know, or, an out or invasion by NATO or Western forces. So indeed, it got their support in large measure. And the victims of that were the majority of people, as well as the uh, liberal Islamist forces they wanted to put down. Um, uh, while simultaneously, of course, they would come to either support, apologize for, or pretend that uh, more radical jihadist, anti-liberal Islamists who were introduced to the region by the U.S. from Yemen to Iraq to Syria to Libya, uh, such as ISIS or Al-Qaeda, uh, they seemed to ignore their role and the opening that they had uh, um, made possible for them to intervene in these kinds of uh, struggles. Right. And, you know, just listening to what you just described reminds me a lot of, you know, I was in Lebanon during the, upper, I mean, Lebanon now, and I was uh, here in 2019 when there was initially a bit of an uprising here. Um, and it was almost, I mean, within just like four, three to five days, it was very, very quickly hijacked by that similar liberal, it was a liberal class of people, these sort of like bourgeoisie um, urban elite types who work for the NGOs and the civil society groups and get a lot of U.S. funding who very, very quickly not only hijacked it, but, you know, some of them, not all of them began to demand sanctions on Lebanon. So that's sort of calling for the destruction, right, the outside meddling to destroy your own country. So it's an ongoing pattern, sadly. We see this among part also of the liberal class in Sudan who mm -hmm. tried to advance a similar agenda. We see... Uh, um, I mean, even some of that happening in Algeria. Uh, so yes, there are you know these forces are quite well entrenched because of good financing, and because of at least three decades of U.S. support and training and EU support and training by NGOs um, uh, to advance uh, uh, a liberal agenda that seemingly on you know on the face of it seems to be uh, uh, you know nice and lovely. You know, who would not support? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, against police brutality for free elections, uh, a free association and a free, free press, we all do. Uh, but this is exactly the price that, that people had to pay uh, as a result of uh, this kind of contest for power um, mm -hmm. uh, or ignoring the actual economic demands that uh, in many ways are the cornerstone of all these uprisings, not only in the Arab world, but across the world. Right. Uh, um, and trans, you know, and transforming the quest for a, 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 a dignified economic life as a frustration with not being able to uh, elect a leader, which again, on discount, it's just a matter of priority for when when you live in a country where eighty five percent of the people live at or below poverty level, uh, their immediate need is actually to be rescued from poverty. It's, it's it's economic, and and economic democracy is never, of course, something they speak about, right? So it's it's anathema. So they support what they call political democracy and economic dictatorship, essentially. So it's that the, the U.S. The US uh, I guess the US model, the US model indeed. Uh, but um, at the same, I mean, but but remember also uh, the US economic dictatorship in a way has slightly more political democracy as a result of the struggles of people against economic dictatorship since the 1930s at least, which brought about a whole battery of laws that uh, insist on interrogating how this economic dictatorship actually works and trying to wrest some control, some uh, concessions from it 
uh, uh, for uh, uh, the, the non-property peoples of the U.S. Uh, a lot of these laws, of course, have been chipped away at in the, in the last uh, 40 years since Reagan, uh, and certainly since Clinton, Obama, the Bushes, and Trump. So nonetheless, whatever remains on the books in the U.S. is the fruit of the labor and the struggle of, of people since the 1920s and 30s that brought these kinds of laws into existence to put some brakes on the economic dictatorship that had always been institutionalized in the U.S. No, exa exactly. I um I wanted to you know turn to because you were talking about the Arab Spring, and it kind of seems like that era. Um, and maybe this is too general to say, but I'm going to say it anyways. It kind of seems like that era has come to an end and it almost feels like a new era, especially with this recent Israeli war on Gaza. And I mean, talking about the region, the region the, over the last 10 years seemed almost to be too distracted with their own local existential issues to really be so concerned about Palestine. And I think a lot of people, at least in the U.S. and the American administrations, maybe assumed that because of the last 10 years and the rise of ISIS and all these things that all these other Arab countries were dealing with, that the issue of Palestine's over. But it does seem like the regional reaction in the Middle East to this recent war is different than the regional, the, the regional reactions we've seen in the recent past. Um, and it comes, of course, on the heels of these normalization agreements, which are now like a laughing stock. But I guess, do you, would you agree with that assessment that the reaction in the Middle East this time around is different than maybe it has been in recent years? And why, if so, why do you think that is? Not really. I don't actually believe the reaction is different, although there are certain manifestations that appear on the surface uh, to be different. Um, first of all, the U.S., uh, the reaction of U.S.-backed regimes in the region um, in general has remained the same, meaning that the goal of their reaction or the next steps they wish to take is how to preserve and secure the apartheid Jewish supremacist regime in Israel and how to safeguard uh, their own interests, of course. So we saw some permitting uh, of some popular pro-Palestinian support in places like Jordan and Egypt, as well as official statements from both uh, uh, regimes um, that have been taken as a change in the two countries' attitude uh, toward uh, the Palestinians, uh, certainly toward Hamas, um, or, or when it is at war uh, with Israel. In reality, I think um, uh, this is far from what happens. I mean, I, I, in many ways, I believe the uh, reasons had to do with the fact that Trump and his team marginalized uh, Egypt and Jordan. These are the first and earliest normalizers with Israel. Um, they had been marginalized by Trump and his team over the last few years in favor of the new Gulf normalizers. Um, and some of that uh, new intimacy between the Americans and the new normalizers, especially the UAE, I mean, the intimacy with um, the uh, kind of uh, not so open normalization between the Saudis and uh, Israel has always been very close. But in many ways, this new intimacy, especially that is being created between Israel and the new normalizers, uh, was correctly, I think, perceived by Egypt and Jordan as at their own expense and at the expense of marginalizing them. Uh, we see this especially um, in the case of Jordan, where its self-appointed role of being a protector or a custodian of the holy places in Jerusalem, uh, the country, the, the Jordanian regime claims to be the custodian of both uh, Muslim and Christian holy places um, in Jerusalem. Uh, this, uh, at, at least the part um, of the Muslim holy places, was being uh, subcontracted to the Saudis to uh, the horror of the Jordanian uh, regime. Um, and uh, the country and the regime was being marginalized, even though previously it had been one of the important uh, also cornerstones of uh, US policy of normalization between Israel and its Arab neighbors. Um, uh, but also at the same time, what we saw that uh, came about as a result of uh, the Israeli colonial assault on the Palestinian people in the last few weeks is that uh, the U.S. Uh, under Biden realized that it still needed its uh, allies who were the earliest of normalizers uh, to be able to uh, safeguard Israel 
uh, and secure it from uh, the volleys of missiles and rockets that were being uh, uh, launched by uh, the Palestinian resistance in Gaza in defense of Palestinian indigenous rights against the ongoing colonial conquest and, and, and uh, depredation caused by Israel. So what we saw uh, first is uh, an uh, you know, approaching Egypt uh, because of its um, both friendly but also quite uh, coercive, powerful relationship that it has uh, to uh, uh, the resistance in Gaza because it controls uh, the only non-Israeli controlled uh, uh, entry and exit uh, point uh, in Gaza so as to place pressure um, on uh, uh, the resistance uh, to, to accept uh, a ceasefire. Uh, on the other hand, the Jordanians were also approached and sort of uh, 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 coaxed into helping out, especially because of their close relations with the fully discredited uh, mercenary uh, agency called the Palestinian Authority. Um, so in that sense, uh, that was a difference uh, in terms of uh, uh, what the war has uh, had precipitated. In terms of the normalizers, I'm not sure how much they won out to begin with. Uh, it, it, you have to realize that one of the major goals of the UAE uh, initially for normalizing with Israel had to do with its interest in purchasing F-35s uh, fighter planes from the US. Um, as we know, many pro-Israeli politicians and lobbyists in the US were against the sale. They remain against the sale, although Biden said he is uh, uh, going to support it, um, at, according to the latest of reports, assuming it completely goes through at some point, delivery should not be expected until 2025 on all kinds of conditions. The UAE even offered that uh, the fighter planes be manned by Israeli pilots for several years uh, before. So that kind of humiliation that uh, uh, this kind of deal has brought about was already, I think, a losing investment in a number of ways. Um, but at the same time, there's a kind of a, a buffoonery of diplomatic reaction. We saw, for example, in the last uh, couple of days, um, the UAE ambassador to Israel uh, visit the Shas rabbi, um, and, and after uh, Shas is the political, the religious one of the religious political parties. There are many, of course, in Israel. Um, after the meeting uh, with the rabbi, he came uh, out to express his uh, admiration for Israeli Zionist tolerance of Islam, mentioning that he had witnessed uh, uh, a mosque in Tel Aviv. Of course, Tel Aviv has no mosques at all. It is the only Western city today that does not have a Muslim population, in fact. What he witnessed, of course, is the annexed part of the Palestinian city of Jaffa, which has uh, still, you know, st still has two old mosques, one that is over 200 years old, built by the Ottomans during Ottoman rule, and the second was built also about 100 years ago in 1916. And of course, um, especially the one that he must have seen, the Hassan Beg uh, Mosque, uh, has been targeted uh, to be for arson and destruction uh, dozens of times since 1948 uh, by the Israelis and by Jewish religious colonial zealots over the years. But it gives you an idea about the kind of buffoonish behavior uh, of some of the diplomats involved in uh, 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 rescuing sort of Israel from the dilemma. Now, at the level of the media, the Gulf-controlled media, uh, the Saudi and UAE-controlled media, of course, was leveling all kinds of attacks and criticisms uh, against uh, the resistance and apologizing for Israel. Uh, <clears throat> And so in that sense, we have not seen any change, really, despite the fact that at the popular level, there has been a huge amount of support for the Palestinians, as there had been normally over the decades uh, across different Arab countries. So let's let's step back a bit and talk a little bit about Zionism and its impact on uh, the region. Because uh, I think it's it's a good conversation to have now, because I feel like there are so many people, at least you know in our American audience, who are really interested in learning about Palestine and understanding what's going on. And this is maybe the first time they're starting to understand what is Zionism. This is a settler colonial ideology. So, so Zionism has its impact on the region. How did the imposition of this Jewish settler state impact the Middle East, not just Palestine, but the Middle East as a whole? And what do, because people are always trying to separate it from Western imperialism. So what do the imperial powers gain from supporting this? And 
to just go a little bit further than that, is Israel still of value to the U.S. and to Western imperialism? That's quite a big question. Let me see how I can address it. Before I do so, I wanted also to mention that, for example, uh, the Saudis who had been uh, hoping to proceed with normalization, uh, this, their efforts have been discouraged by the recent events, of course, because some of the arguments that had been put forth by the normalizers was that normalizing with Israel would actually help the Palestinians and would bring about more peace. And of course, the recent uh, colonial onslaught on the Palestinians has uh, uh, put that claim to rest. So that, that, in that sense, the Saudis are in a bit of a bind uh, um, as a result of this. Now, going to the larger question, um, uh, perhaps uh, I hope you know you, you you will indulge me, but I think I should give you a bit of a uh, or give our audience a bit of a history uh, to yes, understand please. because this investment in the Zionist project, of course, is an old one. It begins in the 16th century with the rise of the Protestant Reformation. Increasingly, millenarian trends within Protestantism insist uh, on uh, the primacy of accelerating the second coming of Jesus Christ. They believe that this could only happen happen once European Jews are uh, converted to Christianity or are uh, sent to Palestine, converted to Christianity, which would bring about the second coming of Jesus. Uh, of, of course, uh, this, these kinds of propositions were opposed by Jews, by European Jews at that time. But this religious axiom would be exceedingly important, a huge amount of writing by Protestant intellectuals from the Reformation, from the 16th through the 18th century and beyond, uh, would uh, take part in writing uh, precisely about this point. And of course, uh, the insistence uh, by the Protestant Reformation that uh, modern, Euro modern European Jews are direct descendants of the ancient Palestinian Hebrews. It's very interesting, of course, uh, uh, because while um, Historical research has shown, of course, that uh, the majority of European Jews are descendants of European converts to Judaism, just like the majority of European Christians are descendants of European converts to Christianity, that European Christians never thought themselves as descendants of the early Palestinian Christians, but somehow they always thought that European Jews were direct descendants of the ancient Hebrews. This idea would combine, by the late 18th century, we begin to see an imperial interest in this idea. Both sometimes combined religious and imperialist, especially as imperialism had had in its early days and even today, a very important Protestant and Christian component of bringing God and Jesus to the heathens, um, which becomes, of course, more civilizational in the 19th century. So it begins to even in France, which had, of course, a substantial Protestant minority, many of whose intellectuals, the Huguenot, many of their Protestant intellectuals had also pushed the idea of so-called Jewish restoration to Palestine. Um, the idea would begin to be also quite popular, so much so that when Napoleon invades Egypt and Palestine at the end of the 18th century and is defeated, um, at the beginning of the 20th uh, of the 19th century in Palestine at the city of Akka or Acre when he gets to Palestine while he's devastating some Palestinian villages he issues a kind of declaration inviting Europe's Jews to quote come back to Palestine um, you know Napoleon Napoleon was uh, uh, quite uh, anti-Jewish. Uh, he uh, had to convene uh, 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 major personalities and <clears throat> the elite of Jewish society in France to make them sort of uh, uh, promise that they would uh, uh, defend uh, France, that they would not uh, engage in practices against Christianity like polygamy and what have you in order to grant them equality in France. So um, the idea of Zionism had always been religious, but also uh, anti-Semitic and anti-Jewish in the sense that it wanted to get rid of Jews. But also the imperial aspect would become very important by the 19th century. The British and the French would begin to push for the idea that the Jew, that European Jews should be uh, sent to Palestine, set up uh, a homeland that would be a kind of a, a way station for French imperialism, like the secretary of Napoleon III, Ernest Laharan, had argued, or like Lord Palmerston, the, the, the foreign secretary of Britain, who was also so a Protestant millenarian uh, uh, also argued. The idea, of course, would become very, very important 
by the 1850s and 1860s uh, for imperialist uh, anti-Semitic forces, especially um, as uh, the completion of the building of the Suez Canal was uh, 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 sort of approaching. We begin to see a kind of a, an imperial attempt to take over all these areas. The Italians go south to Eritrea and Ethiopia uh, to uh, uh, also be uh, in control of certain aspects of the Red Sea, um, if not the Nile as well. Uh, the British, of course, are already expanding also to the south and Sudan and what have you. So um, within that context, the idea of having a way station also near the Suez Canal will gain more and more currency by the end of the 19th century and early 20th century century, especially as Egyptians began to increasingly manifest a revolutionary anti-colonial uh, 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 struggles against the British takeover uh, since the early 1880s, around the same time as Britain, uh, uh, a Zionist movement rather, uh, begins its colonization efforts um, in uh, Palestine. So um, also we have an ident identitarian level, which I think is very important. And in the century, there were sort of two important movements um, that created the idea of Europe for the Enlightenment, right? The idea of Europe begins to ferment during the Renaissance. By the 18th century, the idea of this amorphous entity that is allegedly geographic, but we're not really sure where its borders begin or end, who's in it and who's not out of it. We know some of the people who are in it for sure, you know, the Germans, uh, uh, the Brits and the French, but we're really not sure about the others necessarily. Uh, so the idea of this Europe begins to be so important that two important simultaneous movements, the continuation of this Protestant Zionist movement uh, about the so-called restoration of the Jews would continue to gain traction. Simultaneous with that is the idea of Philhellenism, the idea of that the Greeks who are part of the East, part of the Ottoman Empire, should be extracted from the East and placed in the West because they are now being claimed as the origin of this Europe, just like Judaism is the origin of Christianity. In the 19th century, we see the flowering of thought between the so-called Hebraic and Hellenistic origin of Europe. So we have also an identity issue between uh, uh, the Greeks and the Jews, and especially about the Christian longing to take over two important cities um, which belong to Christendom, namely Constantinople or Istanbul, right, which allegedly was part of, or not allegedly, which had been part of uh, Byzantium, and Jerusalem. Right, because which had, which had fallen from the Crusades into uh, Muslim hands. So this is another sort of part of the historical connection that imperialism uh, and, and settler colonialism would build on um, uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. Now the issue of uh, Palestine and settler colonialism, some, sometimes people think this is a unique in the Arab world. Of course it isn't. There had been several settler colonial projects within Arab countries, aside from the many outside of Arab countries. So we have the major and earliest one in Algeria, where the French come in in 1830. By 1871, they had killed off about a million Algerians, a third of the population, and remain in power there, introducing about a million colonists uh, up to 1962, 132 years. Um, by the 1880s, France uh, establishes a settler colony in Tunisia and begins to bring in its settler colonists. The Italians are a bit jealous and upset because they wanted Tunisia, so they go into Libya in 1911. Between 1911 and 1930, they killed two-thirds of all Libyans, upwards of about half a million to 600,000 people, a genocide that um, seems to be like very little, you know, less known and, and, and talked about. So between 1830 and uh, uh, the 1960s, you have three other settler colonial projects in the Arab world, uh, synchronic with those uh, uh, settler colonial projects is the Zionist project that arrives initially in a haphazard way in the early to mid 1880s and becomes much more organized in the late 1890s and the early part of the 20th century, uh, precisely uh, based on the anti-Semitic argument uh, that as poverty and uh, anti-Jewish attacks are mounting in uh, Russia and Eastern Europe from the 1880s onwards, and Jews are fleeing 
in droves uh, East European Jews to Western Europe as well as to Britain. The British were terribly, terribly upset and concerned about the arrival of what uh, the Prime Minister at the time around 1904, 1905, uh, by the name of Arthur Balfour, called uh, an immigration that was evil in character. Uh, this uh, Prime Minister Balfour would introduce uh, a bill in Parliament to stop Jewish immigration. Indeed, the founder of Zionism, Theodor Herzl, during these negotiations and uh, parliamentary debates goes and testifies before Parliament in Britain, tells them you are right not to allow Jews in Britain, but you must give them another location to go to. And this is how Britain gets to sponsor the Palestine colonization project of Zionism. It would be the same Prime Minister uh, Balfour, who about uh, a decade and a half later is serving as foreign minister in 1917, who issues the Balfour Declaration that promises uh, um, the Zionist movement uh, the establishment of a national home for European Jews um, in Palestine. All right, so this is just to give you a, a bit of a, a background to this. So now, um, Many of these settler colonies have been uh, decolonized, if you will. And they were decolonized uh, because uh, the liberation of these settler colonies, and this includes other settler colonies, Kenya, Namibia, Rhodesia, South Africa. The basis, uh, except for uh, South Africa and, and to a certain extent Rhodesia, the basis of decolonization had been that uh, the colonists who have been living in our land are welcome to continue to live. However, uh, we must grant them equality and deprive them of colonial and racial and religious privileges over the indigenous, indigenous population. Uh, the majority of the white settlers in these colonial settlements were horrified at the possibility that they might become equal and that granting them equality was worse than death. So they voted with their feet and went back to Europe where white supremacy, luckily for them, is still guaranteed uh, mm -hmm. the privileges that they sought. Now, this is, of course, the concern about uh, uh, Israel and the Palestinians. Uh, the, the most terrifying scenario for the imperial powers and the Israelis is that if the Palestinians at some point in the future are ever able to overturn uh, the rule of this uh, Jewish supremacist apartheid regime of Israel and God forbid grant equality to the Jewish colonists uh, by taking away uh, their racial and religious uh, uh, and colonial privileges. Um, so this is usually the, 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 the main concern. Now, um, the imperial forces, of course, have made um, um, uh, much use of the Zionist project since World War I. Remember, one of the most important things that happened after World War I or around it is that uh, the majority of European Jews welcomed the Russian Revolution, which, of course, was uh, 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 radically uh, 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 an enemy of anti-Semitism. And this is why, of course, the British and Western supported uh, white armies uh, that were fighting the Russian Revolution, were committing massive pogroms and massacres in the Pale of Settlement where Russian Jews were restricted to living by the czars. So as a result of the Russian Revolution, uh, the majority of Jews supported uh, the revolution, but also those who didn't support it, other socialist uh, groups, such as the, uh, the Jewish Bund, a very important and much more popular uh, 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 group in, throughout many of the decades of the 20th century than the Zionists, not to mention the fact that um, uh, this was going to uh, end anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe and bring about sort of uh, economic equality. Um, it was not a coincidence that the Balfour Declaration was issued about five days before the final triumph of the Russian Revolution mm -hmm. to forestall the possibility that uh, uh, East European and Russian Jews should have to support the Russian Revolution and instead should support the Zionist movement. Indeed, Churchill, by 1920, would pen a most anti-Semitic screed in the Times of London, where he would castigate all Jews as part of an international conspiracy to bring about communism and bring down Western civilization. But he did accept the Zionists, who did not want bring down Western Christian civilization through their colonial project. So anti-Semitism and anti-communism became one and the same, right? So this is part of Tsarist propaganda who argued that the Bolsheviks and the Russian Revolution were a Jewish conspiracy. Right. This would be exported first to Churchill, 
who would, of course, put forth these ideas uh, blatantly, and he was a major supporter of Zionism, then we would see how the Nazis would take this up. But the idea all along was that um, this would be very, very helpful to uh, British imperialism. One, because uh, it would sponsor the settler colony that would maintain its uh, uh, influence uh, for decades to come, and at the same time, undercut uh, the popularity of communism among a group that the British imperialists and anti-Semites thought was its main uh, 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 clientele. Um, the U.S. would take over from there after World War II, and Israel, of course, would, uh, as a settler colony, as a European settler colony, uh, provide a huge amount of services to uh, uh, the French and the British, as well as to the Americans. In 1956, it would accept to participate in the tripartite invasion of Egypt by Britain, France, and of course Israel in response to President Nasser's uh, nationalization of the Suez Canal Company at that time. The Israelis, of course, had asked for quid pro quo, and they insisted that the French grant them uh, and built for them an important nuclear reactor uh, to produce nuclear weapons, which of course the French would do at Dimona. This was finished in 1964, but that was the quid pro quo for the Israelis um, uh, helping imperial forces invade Egypt at the time. By 1967, the Israelis had been so uh, uh, had become so strong uh, uh, militarily by French support and American and British support that they were able to defeat uh, Nasser of Egypt, which the U.S. had tried to assassinate or overthrow unsuccessfully for, unsuccessfully for years. So it had a very important role to play. By the 70s, uh, the Israelis would become the major allies of apartheid South Africa, of Somoza's Nicaragua, uh, of Pinochet's Chile. Uh, of Taiwan, which was considered at the time a pariah country. So we begin to see major services, um, especially by the 1980s, late 70s and early 80s, that uh, Israel could uh, act as a proxy for U.S. imperialism around the third world. Uh, and also, you know, it's kind of a, in, in many ways a, a U.S. military base. And um, sometimes I usually argue with people who find it unconscionable that the U.S. gives so much uh, financial help to Israel. I don't buy that argument. I think Israel deserves every penny of this imperial funding. Israel render, has rendered a huge amount of services. It is indeed an American military base staffed by Jewish soldiers who, when they fight wars in their own interest and in the interest of U.S. empire, they die instead of American soldiers coming home in body bags. And I don't think Israel costs the U.S. much more than American military bases across the region. I think it, and, 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 and the, the other bases are actually staffed by American soldiers whom the U.S. would rather uh, they not be killed in a military conflagration. So Israel, in fact, has been a, a, a huge uh, uh, sort of help to imperial interests in the region. Now, of course, sometimes it is a costly help and uh, it can lose um, um, U.S. and uh, the Europeans all kinds of allies that they could potentially have, or so the argument goes. Not true, really, not true. Uh, many, uh, many of the Arab regimes, or if not most of them, have been uh, U.S. or Western backed throughout their careers in the, in the post-war period, and um, none of them were lost uh, as uh, uh, sort of uh, agents of the West as a result of uh, U.S. support for Israel. On the contrary, they had been shepherded by the Americans increasingly to become equally close to Israel. So I think the Zionist lobby has always been right. I, I never supported the oil uh, lobby of American politicians who argued that the U.S. should not support Israel because it would lose its Arab allies. I think Israel is an imperialist interest, and um, uh, or historically has been. At the moment, perhaps that's no longer the case in the sense that it might very well be more costly to support this last uh, openly racist uh, settler colony in Asia, uh, mostly because uh, the U.S. and neoliberal investment often prefer stability to instability, although instability sometimes is preferred because it can be much more profitable for investors. Uh, killing people uh, uh, can be more profitable. Uh, 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 and selling arms, of course, as we know, this is what the military industrial complex has been doing uh, for decades. Uh, but nonetheless, sometimes for other kinds of investments, a kind of stability of rule is, is important. And the Israelis um, you know, are the only uh, European settler colony uh, 
today, uh, and many survive, whether the US, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, uh, uh, not to mention the Latin American settler colonies, uh, it is the only one that needs to content, constantly assert its right to exist on a daily basis. Um, no one buys its right to exist, not only among its victims, but even among its supporters who always want to shove down our throats that Israel should have a right to exist. They don't have to do this with uh, other white settler colonies, well, mostly because they have eliminated most of the population and try to marginalize and completely ignore and repress uh, the struggling and, and, and resisting uh, population that has managed to survive the onslaught of genocide. Um, uh, but nonetheless, uh, Israel is in that sense um, not stable, right? Mm -hmm. No one has been planted in a region where the resistance to its implantation as a colonial settlement has been ongoing since the first year of the arrival of of Jewish colonists in 1882, 1883, and their takeover of Palestinian lands. Uh, peasant uprisings have continued. The latest uh, uh, onslaught on the colonial onslaught on the Palestinians have provoked yet another resistance uh, effort by the Palestinians, whether uh, uh, civilian, whether armed, uh, whether in the, in, the, in the form of marches, of uh, a major strike across Palestine, uh, many instruments of anti-colonial resistance by the indigenous Palestinians uh, were employed in the latest uh, uh, attempt uh, by the Palestinian people to defend themselves against this ongoing uh, colonial settler Zionist onslaught on their societies. That was really well, but really well explained uh, and very comprehensive. And I think it, it it kind of goes into the next question I have for you. Speaking of, because you mentioned, you know, maybe Israel's not quite as important as it once was to Western imperialism. And so the media coverage has changed. And this might have something to do with that. Um, but, you know, there is this slight shift in discourse in corporate media and mainstream media, which has traditionally always been unconditionally pro-Israel. There's a little bit more space, right, to question Israel's behavior, uh, to question the racism in Israeli society, um, and to talk about Palestinians as though they actually are human beings as opposed to just like animals and terrorists who deserve to be slaughtered. Um, are you enthusiastic by about this slight change in discourse? about Palestine in the Western press. There's also, you know, Human Rights Watch writing this report calling Israel uh, Israel's policies apartheid. Um, the New York Times publishing those photos of the children killed in Gaza. I mean, this is pretty unprecedented. Does it matter? Um, I mean, yes and no. I'm, I'm not as enthusiastic as some people are. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, um, I've learned from the Israelis never to accept yes for an answer. Right. So um, I'm not impressed by this type of support for Palestinians as victims. I know the history uh, of, of this type of, of support. Let me also perhaps give you a historical narrative. Um, the Palestinians, of course, were utterly ignored uh, from 1948 onwards, the extent to which they had been at all mentioned in the Western press, they would be as these Arab refugees. Um, uh, and this is when, you know, when, when they come up at all in any kind of uh, coverage in the 1940s and the 1950s. By the late 1960s, when the Palestinians took up arms um, uh, in, in the form of guerrilla warfare, against Israel and began to stage spectacular uh, plane hijackings in the late 60s to bring the attention of the world to their plight as a colonized people. They began to be depicted in the West as barbaric terrorists and things of that sort. This would continue throughout the 1970s until 1982. Once uh, the, the horrifying massacres of Sabra and Shatila took place in September of 1982 in Beirut uh, by right-wing fascist Christian forces with the cooperation of the Israelis who oversaw these massacres, uh, you began to see a transformation of the Palestinians from objects of contempt as barbaric terrorists into objects of sympathy as possible victims of the violence um, either directly of Israel or of Israeli-approved violence by Israel's proxies. 
This would continue until the late 1980s. There was a shift during the first Palestinian uprising of 1987 to 1993 of allowing the Palestinians to not only be objects of sympathy or of contempt, but suddenly of becoming subjects who could speak and articulate, who would be allowed to speak and articulate a political program, but only in so far as that political program did not question uh, the very basis of Western support for Israel. So questioning, for example, the illegal occupation of 1967, this created a bifurcation whereby Western white liberals, Christians or Jews, would find it unconscionable, uh, at least those of them who opposed the Israeli occupation, that Jewish colonial settlers should set up colonies on confiscated Palestinian lands in the West Bank and Gaza, but that would have been okay in 1948 Palestine. So there was a, that kind of hypocrisy of what was allowed to happen between 48 and 67 inside what becomes Israel uh, was seen as not conducive to peace and stability after 1967. So you begin to see Palestinians who begin to articulate this kind of a um, uh, non-challenging views to the West that seem to go hand in hand with the emerging uh, 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 let's see, understanding of a liberal human rights discourse. Remember, the Palestinians had been highly supported by the rest of the world while they were depicted in this manner since the 1950s until the 1980s in the West. Most of the third world supported them. The PLO had 100 embassies around the world, more than twice the number of embassies that Israel had at the time. So it was only in the Western coverage that was inimical to, Palestin to Palestinians and their interests. Now, after 1993, we also see Palestinians depicted now as repentant terrorists whom as a result of the graciousness of uh, uh, the Israelis and white uh, liberals and conservatives around the world should be forgiven or not forgotten though, their crimes should not be forgotten of defending themselves against the onslaught of colonialism, but we should forgive them and at least try to make peace with them. This would continue on and off, uh, so condemnation of Palestinian resistance, support for Palestinian collaboration with the West to bring about a final surrender of Palestinian rights to Israeli settler colonialism. By 2000, Arafat was unable to continue this game because he was going to lose his own legitimacy. I mean, he would have been happy to do it, but you know, he explained it that he, to, to, to the Israelis and to the Americans. At that point, he became again an unrepentant terrorist, and he was, um, and the Palestinians again began to be depicted the same way they had been in the 70s and 80s as not a proper partner for peace negotiations with the Americans or with the Israelis. Um, so in that sense, all these images since the 1960s have continued. The most consistent ones is that since uh, uh, 1982 is to sympathize with Palestinians only as victims. And often this is motivated by an attempt to save Israel from itself. Uh, this is uh, uh, by mainstream conservative and liberal politicians, but also more recently by some liberal politicians to save Israel from the grip of the right wing Netanyahu. And this, and, but we've also seen this uh, film before. In the late 1970s, uh, uh, Jewish liberals in Israel and outside were appalled at Begin's policies and invasions of Lebanon, and they thought that Begin had defiled their beautiful Israel that existed so beautifully before 1977. Uh, the poor Menachem Begin was quite upset about this, and he decided to open the archives in the 1980s to demonstrate the amount of massacres committed by the labor governments and Ben-Gurion in 1948, so that they, because they would compare unfavorably, uh, uh, given their uh, level of atrocities to the uh, to the massacres that he co-sponsored in Lebanon. So, right. and I think he was right to do so, right? In, in, in an attempt to show that he had not been the bad guy uh, he was depicted to be. So I think poor Netanyahu is being placed in the same light as a Begin. It's utterly unfair. It's utterly unfair to him. You know, he is not worse at all than any of his predecessors. His style may be slightly more gruff, but um, I mean, um, it's, that, that's what really offends the sensibilities of liberals. They would rather Palestinians be uh, killed while the soldiers, you know, as a, the Zionist dictum has it, they shoot and cry. They yes. really don't want to kill them, but they have to in a way. But um, in the case of Netanyahu, he says, no, we shoot and we laugh. So liberals are upset about that. But, you know, 
Just it's give me one second. Just give me one second because I'm in Lebanon. My electricity just went out, but it'll be back on in a second and then everyone will see me. This is the reality of the Middle East. <laughs> Here we go. Lebanon. I don't know about the Middle East. <laughs> well, the reality of Lebanon. Good point. Good point. I shouldn't um I shouldn't speak so unfairly about the rest of the, about the rest of the region. It's not fair to compare their electricity to mine. <laughs> Lebanon and Gaza, and let's not forget why this is, because the Israelis have destroyed all the electric uh, uh, power grids in Lebanon during right. their many invasions of Lebanon, and of course they control the rationing of electricity to Gaza, uh, of and which, which they use uh, as a bargaining chip to deprive the uh, uh, two million uh, or so Gazans uh, uh, from uh, electricity uh, on a daily basis. Right. It's sorry. I'm just fixing this techni technically. Okay, there we go. Now you can see me normally again. But no, you're absolutely right. That is exactly uh, what we have to deal with here in Lebanon and Gaza. I think it's actually a little bit worse. Um, but I, I didn't mean to interrupt your, your explanation. Well, I, I, I'm sorry. Please complete your thought. Yeah, what I wanted to say is that the pictures of uh, the New York Times, of course, the New York Times would never have had the audacity to do so had Haaretz, the Israeli a mainstream liberal sort of uh, uh, elite newspaper, not published them first. Uh, but also remember, again, Palestinians are being depicted as objects of sympathy, as victims, right? They don't, we don't have the right to speak for ourselves. But, you know, white Americans can sympathize with our condition when we are shown to be victims in ways that uh, cannot be easily hidden uh, or swept under the rug. So you have that. But um, also remember that this uh, recent coverage was, uh, 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 or simultaneous with it, was this huge Israeli propaganda and, and Zionist propaganda campaign about an alleged huge anti-Semitic onslaught on the American Jewish community or the British Jewish community or the French or German Jewish communities, uh, which has been shown in a series of reports uh, 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 to be, of course, uh, uh, mostly based on fabrications and on very scanty evidence uh, 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 and uh, uh, the extent to which there had been uh, anything of the sort. They were isolated uh, incidents, which, of course, uh, must be condemned, but they in no way reflect on the movement of solidarity with the Palestinians. But remember, this is also, there was no change there in that the Israelis have always had one important strategy that they even began when the Zionists began this campaign back in the teens and the 20s of calling anyone who opposes the colonial settler project as an anti-Semite, right? So you see this in the 20s and 30s and 40s, but you begin to see this in earnest after 1972. At that time, uh, the foreign minister of Israel, Abba Ibn, uh, was speaking at a conference by the American Jewish Congress, I think convening in Jerusalem, and he articulated the new strategy, saying that basically while anti-Semitism had been historically a right-wing ideology, now it has invaded the American new left, uh, who must be fought. It, its new name is anti-Zionism, but it remains anti-Semitic. He targeted also, of course, Jews who, who were critical of Israel at the time, two prominent uh, Jewish personalities, Noam Chomsky and I.F. Stone, as self-hating Jews um, who are feeling uh, guilty, uh, what he called survival guilt, those who survived the Holocaust. Um, at any rate, we can see this. By 2007, uh, the American Jewish Committee uh, had... Uh, in the U.S. writes a, a, an op-ed horrified about the increasing number of American Jews who are very critical of Israel and oppose Israel, uh, echoing the earlier concern by uh, Abba Ibn. By 2016, uh, the Israeli strategy now subcontracts uh, this idea of defending Israeli settler colonialism with the charge of anti-Semitism to the European-based International uh, Holocaust uh, Remembrance Alliance. Excuse me, I need to get some water. No, please do. <laughs> <clears throat> so um, um, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, or the IHRA, introduces this new definition in 2016, um, which includes questioning Israel's right to exist meaning as a Jewish colonial settler state, as being anti-Semitic. This is now adopted by the European Union and individual European company, uh, European countries, by the US administration under Biden and under Trump. Um, 
So um, every time Israel is being condemned rightly for its colonial uh, settler conquests of the Palestinian people and their lands, the defense is, no, no, the Palestinians are attacking or are, are uh, resisting Israel because they're Jewish. So in the sense that Palestinians would welcome other colonizers to take over their lands had they been Muslim or Hindu or Christian. The only problem they have with their colonists is that they're Jewish, not that they're colonists. Um, but it seems to be, I mean, given the amount of repetition in a kind of a Goebbelsian way, right, if you just repeat a lie so many times it becomes true, uh, uh, this has become a, a kind of an axiom of some of the, or, or of many of the defenders and the lobbyists uh, for Israel. Uh, so in that sense, uh, uh, I, I, so I don't think there's been a change in that regard about this. Now, of course, uh, the major change is as a result of social media, which, of course, also is a, is a double-edged sword because, of course, the Zionists and their allies are much more powerful. We've seen how the social media uh, 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 companies have blocked banned, censored uh, pro-Palestinian views. Uh, I've heard um, of incidents of if someone puts the picture of the child Muhammad Durra who was killed during the Second Intifada, uh, Facebook or Instagram, I think, would say, oh, we find this picture irrelevant to the topic at hand. So they, they are now arbiters of what is relevant and what is not relevant. So we've seen these acts of censorship continue. I saw, um, perhaps in the British press, in The Guardian, which is usually very Zionist and, and, and anti-Palestinian and certainly was part of the uh, 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 campaign accusing uh, the Labour Party of anti-Semitism to bring down Corbyn, nonetheless, it seemed to have allowed uh, temporarily a few articles by Palestinians describing uh, the kind of life they have be labored under uh, 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 living under the yoke of Israeli uh, settler colonialism and Jewish supremacy uh, for 70 years in, in the case of those who live in the 1948 colonized areas versus those who live in the 1967 colonized areas. So I think, um, you know, video uh, cameras uh, on, on mobile phones have, of course, provided all kinds of evidence that cannot always be so easily swept under the rug. Um, and indeed, uh, the internet has opened uh, some uh, venues for, you know, for an alternative press, uh, which is combated effectively, I think, by the mainstream uh, views and, and, and social media, but nonetheless can find readers in ways that one uh, uh, would not have had access to prior to this revolution in technology and the internet in the last uh, 30 years or so. Uh, so I think, uh, so in that sense, um, you know, there's a bit of a change, but uh, not really. The change is in the details, right? Palestinians have, some Palestinians have uh, on occasion been uh, uh, invited to write for the New York Times, uh, very, very few. Um, I should say that I have also, you know, had discussions with people uh, you know, for many decades now about uh, the racism of the New York Times toward uh, non-Palestinians. For example, if one or two Palestinians are killed, uh, their story of their murder would uh, make it to the New York Times, whereas it would take maybe uh, 100 Congolese or Ugandans to be yeah. killed or to be published in the New York Times. So people would say, see, the New York Times is you know, biased toward the Palestinians by always covering uh, any atrocities. So I have to explain that, in fact, the New York Times, when it covers the murder of Palestinians or the destruction of their homes, it is it often does that to justify why Israel had to murder them. Yeah. So it's by way of justification, so that what is important for the New York Times is justifying Israeli settler colonialism and colonial murder of Palestinians. It is not the Palestinians who are really important to be covered. In the case of Uganda, say, or uh, 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 the Congo, uh, it is neither interested in the perpetrators nor in the victims, given its long-standing uh, anti-African racism, let alone anti-African-American racism. So right. just to clarify that note, I think, is important for uh, some of the listeners uh, or, you know, or the people watching us. Absolutely. Um, and I really do, I want to say, I, I know you're struggling with the water. Thank you so much for the time that you've given me. I promise I'm getting near the end, but I have to ask you this question because it's related to the recent uh, the recent war on Gaza. Um, looking back at the battle um, that, you know, the way it went down, 
how do you assess the results now that we've had some time to sort of like settle and see, you know, was it tactically prudent for Hamas to intervene? Uh, and do you think that they scored a victory, whatever a victory might mean? And if so, why? Um, I definitely think this called a victory. Uh, you should see the victory parades uh, in Jordan and Amman, where I am now, uh, that you know had been ongoing for a while, um, but also in Gaza itself, in the West Bank, in Jerusalem, um, uh, uh, in uh, uh, colonized Palestine and Israel itself, and elsewhere. Um, uh, Victory in this sense, of course, is, I mean, uh, again, uh, uh, the Palestinians have never been uh, a match uh, militarily for Israel. Israel has one of the uh, largest armies, I think the third most powerful air force in the world, the fourth most powerful army. It is the sixth or fifth uh, most powerful nuclear power around the world. The poor Palestinians have, you know, some homemade rockets that they've been able to improve in the last few years as a result of allies uh, of the resistance, whether the Lebanese resistance um, or more recently Iran. Uh, that despite the uh, ongoing uh, uh, anti-Shiite racism and sectarianism introduced by the U.S. and its Saudi and Gulfi allies since 2004. Uh, to fight off Iranian influence in Iraq, but also to fight off the uh, uh, Lebanese resistance um, and subsequently used uh, against the Syrian regime. Um, it is interesting today that um, all the major Arab Sunni powers are the ones who normalize with Israel and defend Israeli atrocities. And it is, in fact, Iran and the Lebanese resistance, um, and more recently, even uh, Syria, uh, with whom the Palestinian resistance seems to be uh, resuming some relations uh, who have come forth to help uh, the Palestinians. Now, it is interesting to me that sometimes the, uh, the resistance may be faulted for having allies whose uh, credentials on democratic rule may not satisfy the critics. That's a legitimate uh, uh, critique, um, although, of course, it would have to be balanced by um, uh, why such a critique would not be possible, for example, about the closeness of Hamas to Qatar, hardly a paragon of democracy, or previously to the, you know, the, the Palestinians being uh, supported by the Saudis, another not terribly uh, uh, democratic rule. After all, Iran has uh, regular free elections and has an elected government, even if people make uh, critique uh, so, you know, repressive aspects of that government and its policies, they cannot deny that its uh, regime is elected um, in a way, and, and, and of course, certainly more freely than any other regime uh, in the region. So uh, this being said, I think, uh, first of all, uh, what the resistance uh, has done in, in the last few weeks is dispel the myth of Israeli deterrence and a terribly, terribly uh, uh, unsuccessful attempt by Israel and its U.S. supply technology to stop the onslaught of uh, Palestinian uh, uh, missiles uh, raining in on uh, the Zionist uh, colonies uh, across the land. It also was able to unify the struggle of the Palestinians, uh, that basically against their uh, main enemy, uh, in a simultaneous and synchronic manner. In the sense that people have always, I mean, people, people have been saying that Palestinians uh, are now resisting Israel, uh, uh, their main enemy, as if they had not before. What happened more recently is, in fact, that this was a synchronic, simultaneous acts of resistance in the different parts of colonized Palestine. Right, so you know, as 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 opposed to say an uprising only in the West Bank or in Gaza or uprisings in uh, inside Israel, uh, etc. So this was an an, an amazing, uh, important uh, act of unity of resistance, uh, employing a number of forms of resistance across the land, across uh, Palestine. Palestinian uh, uh, or an Israeli mixed cities in Israel proper across the West Bank, uh, uh, you know, basically challenging the Israeli occupation army checkpoints, even though, of course, the Palestinian Authority, which, as we know, is a mercenary force uh, trying to uh, uh, limit Palestinian resistance and suppress it against Israel. I think the effect of the war was to instill fear in, 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 the, uh, in the hearts of the Jewish colonists across uh, 1948 Israel for the 11 days duration of the war, um, which I think uh, the Palestinian resistance intended to uh, uh, convey as a message that this is uh, the price 
that uh, the colonists would have to pay for supporting and maintaining Jewish supremacy and apartheid in Israel. Um, uh, of course, we do not uh, condone uh, uh, the killing of civilians on uh, uh, any side. Um, and of course, uh, the Palestinians, unlike the Israelis, do not have guidance programs that are advanced to be able to just target uh, the Israeli uh, uh, military installations precisely. But I think the fact that they uh, uh, targeted um, Israeli uh, cities and military installations or industrial installations uh, in them, uh, in a way, also flipped the Israeli strategy. Israeli strategy had always been that they would rein in devastation on the Palestinian civilian policy population of Gaza, starve them, uh, keep them imprisoned in open-air prisons until so as to drive them to revolt against the Palestinian resistance and against Hamas. What Hamas and uh, Islamic Jihad and the rest of the resistance did more recently is use this lesson to teach Israel uh, and the Israeli colonists basically to make them demand that their government give up on Jewish supremacy and apartheid so that they can be secure and safe from these missiles. And we already see the weakening of Netanyahu. Uh, mind you, of course, the uh, Israeli colonial Jewish population's majority may very well support even more uh, 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 punitive strikes against the Palestinians for daring to uh, resist uh, Israeli colonialism. But we also see uh, also the opinion shifting uh, against these policies by some. And I think if these battles uh, uh, resume, and they are likely to resume, uh, uh, given the history of Israeli settler colonialism and its reticence to stop its onslaught, I think from now on, the price to be paid by the Jewish colonists would be too high for them, as it would be for any of us, uh, had we accepted uh, to live in a, a settler colony that grants us uh, uh, racial and colonial privileges, and uh, uh, may very well opt to leave, as many uh, uh, have said in interviews on Israeli television. Um, so um, uh, I think the linking, the regional linking of Palestinian resistance to the Lebanese resistance was very, very important. The recent uh, declarations by leaders of both resistance that any actions uh, that would undermine the status of Jerusalem and its holy places would be taken as a casus belli, as reason for war, and a combined war in the sense that Gaza from now on, if attacked, will not be expected to respond on its own alone, but it would be joined by uh, uh, the other uh, 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 bodies of resistance, not only in Lebanon, but elsewhere in the region that would uh, jump in to defend the Palestinians against this uh, ongoing uh, colonial onslaught. Um, and in that sense, I think uh, this alliance has also undermined the Saudi and US sponsored anti-Shiite sectarianism in the region um, in order to restore uh, uh, to its proper place uh, the, the heroism of the Lebanese uh, resistance, especially of Hezbollah, uh, to its rightful place after having been denigrated uh, by these forces since 2004 as a, a sectarian other um, uh, in faith, and, and, and of course uh, opposed by some kind of a, a Sunni alliance, which of course, as we know, uh, many Sunnis have rejected, but not the Sunni regimes who have espoused uh, such a view. So I think um, these are major achievements. Of course, uh, uh, the cost that Palestinians pay with their lives and property has been immense, but it has uh, such a price Palestinians have been paying for 140 years, loss of property and their lives by the onslaught of Zionist-sponsored Jewish colonialism. Uh, so I, um, uh, regrettable as that is, sad and horrifying as that is, uh, 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 to uh, all Palestinians, um, the sense of victory is uh, derives from derives from the ability of the Palestinians to begin to resist. Uh, 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 I think uh, together um, to resist effectively um, to tell Israel and the, its Jewish colonists who support its policies that uh, they will have to pay a price. Uh, for maintaining this type of government and this type of settler colonialism. Um, um, and this kind of, uh, for many Palestinians, has given hope that perhaps this augurs the beginning of a much larger Palestinian uh, resistance um, uh, that can put a stop 
to the ongoing uh, Israeli settler colonialism and, uh, as many of us hope, effectively reverse it once and for all. Yeah, I mean, I have to assume, and actually I know just from some people I've spoken to that, the you know, the first of all, the Israelis come out looking, they should be embarrassed. Because like you mentioned earlier, they have the third most powerful air force in the world. And they couldn't stop a barrage of rockets from the most besieged area in the world. They had 160 fighter planes bombing Gaza simultaneously, right? right. You know, a very, very tiny area filled with a uh, uh, civilian population. Yeah. So it's kind of... Uh, it's uh, amazing. It's amazing, actually, what Palestinian resistance in Gaza has managed to achieve under the conditions that they have. And that's just, I mean, that's just one group in Gaza. And then when you see the participate or the cooperation between Hamas, Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah, and Iran, I mean, if I was the Israelis, I would be looking at Gaza and then looking at Lebanon, where Hezbollah is not under siege. Um, and thinking to myself that, the, I mean, I, I would want to think twice before going to war again. And in a way, Hamas has managed to establish some, I think, sense of deterrence, perhaps, uh, with this recent war. I, I, um, I, believe, I, mean, I mean, remember, this is why I mentioned the, the, the issue of Hamas's calculation um, or that the effect of what it had done would be to instill fear in the hearts of uh, the majority of the Jewish colonists who support uh, this system. Um, uh, the Jewish colonists have been, uh, uh, aside from participating in, in the war, since they are all conscripted into the war effort of Israel, uh, the civilian populations, or in their capacity as civilians, have not had to suffer the consequences of all the wars that Israel had visited on the Palestinians. Um, a, a few border attacks in the 1950s, a few border attacks in the 60s, but for the most part, Israeli cities had been spared, uh, unlike Arab cities, uh, from uh, Beirut to uh, Ismailia in Egypt to Irbid in Jordan, who had been bombed uh, mercilessly over the years, uh, not to mention other Lebanese cities. <coughs> Um, and, and Syria, uh, including Damascus, whom the Israelis continue uh, to bomb uh, erratically and uh, but continuously. Um, uh, not to mention the bombings, uh, you know, of, of other places of, of Khartoum in Sudan, of Baghdad's nuclear reactor, of Tunisia. Uh, so the Israelis had been uh, had had a free hand in bombing uh, Arab countries and Arab cities um, uh, for decades. Um, for their own population to feel the brunt of uh, the resistance of the indigenous population on whose lands they continue to live and steal and colonize uh, is a novelty. Um, this cannot be, I think, uh, uh, underestimated at the psychological level. And I believe it will have uh, political consequences uh, uh, in the long term, um, uh, if not in the short term. That was, Joseph, I want to thank you so much for uh, spending time explaining all this. And before we wrap, I wanted to give you the opportunity to talk a little bit about the your forthcoming book that you've been working on. Um, so can you give our viewers and listeners an idea of what you have in the works? Uh, it's quite a large book. Uh, it's tentatively titled. I like the title, but, you know, sometimes we change things. Um, uh, it's titled uh, uh, The Age of Independence. Uh, it's a kind of a... a it's a history, an uh, intellectual, political, and uh, uh, legal uh, history of the world since the 17th century on the question of settler colonialism and the quest for independence. So it, it's, it has a large geographic scope, uh, begins intellectually, legally, uh, and geographically in Europe and the Americas. Uh, it, it, it travels to Africa, to Oceania, to New Zealand and Australia. Uh, we visit the uh, uh, Philippines and Indonesia, and we go to all the part of Central Asia where the Russians also had set up settler colonies during the, Tsar, uh, the Tsarist rule in the 18th and 19th uh, centuries. Um, so it's, it's a, it, it tries to be as comprehensive as possible to give a large a larger view, a comparative view, if you will, of settler colonialism across the world and the ideas that uh, portended this kind of project, the legal arguments put forth, and the kinds of uh, strategies uh, um, and, and rhetoric that had been employed to justify it, the kinds of resistance it had uh, uh, elicited. Um, and it situates 
the Palestinians there as well. The Palestinians have a good share of this book, uh, perhaps slightly more than others, but mostly because uh, their settler colonialism is ongoing uh, uh, in Asia and Africa as much as it is uh, uh, ongoing in the Americas and in Australia and New Zealand. But in Asia and Africa, I would say, except for South Africa, uh, which continues to be labor under economic uh, white supremacy, even if political white supremacy had ended, the Palestinians are the last Asian or African group to be labor under the economic and political settler colonial uh, 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 racial supremacy uh, of a regime. Um, and of course, the, the purpose is to show that, in fact, uh, uh, none of these settler colonialism has been unique. Certainly, the Palestinians are not unique. Uh, the Zionist movement is not unique at all. I, I try to show how terribly uninventive and unoriginal <laughs> is with its arguments. They're all just borrowed, a mishmash of uh, European colonial arguments from across um, uh, the colonial world and from across the settler colonies. Um, uh, and, and so in that sense, I try to normalize both Palestine and Zionism. Often the Zionists have claimed that there is something special and, and, and unique about uh, the Zionist uh, Jewish movement. I try to show that there is nothing unique about it, in fact, or very, very few things that are unique that are not really central to who it is and what it has done. Um, and sometimes also Palestinian nationalists think that they're somehow uh, unique in their struggle in the world. And I try to show that, in fact, uh, uh, they have not been at all and they remain not unique, although uh, they are part of an honorable uh, global struggle against uh, settler colonialism that has gone on for the last four centuries, at least, uh, um, and that similar strategies and, and, and uh, uh, oppression uh, had been uh, and continues to be experienced by uh, other colonized indigenous populations across the world. So, um, so in that, but, but there's an argument about independence, how it begins. There's an idea. There's an argument about the idea of self determination. I've already published on this, trying to show that many of these lofty ideas actually began with white settler colonists seeking to separate themselves from the mother country, that uh, then they would become appropriated by the colonized for themselves. But I show, I try to show the limitations of these concepts uh, for the use of the colonized, given their uh, uh, the original sin of uh, these concepts having been crafted by uh, white supremacist settler colonists for their own uh, 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 interests and uh, independence and self-determination. I'll, I'll, I'll stop at the description here and, uh, uh, you know, hopefully uh, I'll finish writing the book sometime this year. It's quite a well, we large, look, it's taken a long time. Well, we look forward to it and hopefully we can have you back on the program even sooner than when it comes out. But I want to thank you again, Joseph Massad, Professor of Modern Arab Politics and Intellectual History at Columbia University for coming on Breakthrough News. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much for hosting me.